This morning, uh, my message is titled, Hiding in the Wilderness. And um, shall we pray before we begin? God, we thank you that you have brought us together again this morning. Lord, we ask that you come and speak to us this morning. Come and speak to our hearts. Help us to open up our hearts to you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Uh, last night, I finished about five minutes over time. Hope that I can finish uh, on time this morning. Now, the, the message, uh, Hiding in the Wilderness, is based on Elijah's, the account of Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 17. And uh, it's a very interesting period in Elijah's life. This message is for people they are going through certain periods in their life where nothing much seems to be happening because that's what we're going to read, that in this time in Elijah's life, nothing much is happening. Now, as Asians, uh, as people who work hard, and many of us work hard here, or all of us work hard here, um, it can be very stressful to feel that we are not doing anything. Did you know that reports came out from China that um, for the Chinese New Year, right, some of the young Chinese fellas don't want to go back home. And in uh, Chinese New Year for China is like huge. And some of you may know that it's the biggest mass migration of people in the world every Chinese New Year in China, in modern times. There has never been so many people that travel to a place or do travel, leave their, whatever they are working during the same period of time. But there are some Chinese people that don't want to go home because, right, maybe they lost their jobs. Maybe they are still, like, uh, at a certain level. Maybe they have not gotten the promotion they want. Maybe they don't have life partner yet. And they are so stressed out to go back because their relatives will question them. And some of them say, unlike, well, here in Malaysia, where maybe you go back to your hometown for a while, for some of us, and then we just meet them for a few hours. In China, when you go back home, for some of them, you are with your relatives for days. So you're facing days of people uh, asking you, hey, why are you not married? Uh? Hey, why are you not attached? Uh? Hey, got no child? Uh? Hey, why your job? Hey, how's your job? How's everything happening? And all these things, right, it's about like, what are you doing in your life? And when they go back, like the report is empty, right? It's like very stressful. They would rather not go back. They would rather say, oh, I'm sick. Oh, I got no money to travel back or whatever it is. Oh, I can't get a ticket. I can't get a ticket on the train or whatever it is. I can't go back. Just to skip all the questioning because we are so used to doing something and moving somewhere during our lives. So uh, if that is you, uh, I'm thinking of you during this message. Now, as we talk about Elijah... We, or as we read about Elijah, right, we need to uh, understand, or rather it's helpful for us to understand who Elijah was. Elijah is one of the ma most famous prophets in the Bible. And um, he is someone that God used greatly and God displayed much of his power and miracles throughout Elijah's life. Elijah was known for a very significant act where he confronted the nation and the religious leaders or of the nation, the the the, the prophets of the 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 other the idol god uh, Baal, and he basically uh, showed the entire nation of Israel that they should turn back to God, and so God used him uh, very greatly. And uh, Elijah's name is the Lord. Uh, his, the meaning is that the, the Lord is my God or Yahweh is my God. But this account that we're going to read, right, is a time when uh, Elijah was not used for something very great, but he was told to hide instead. It was a time of drought and famine in the land where he lived. Okay, so now let's read the account. Then the Lord said to Elijah, Go to the east and hide by the Kerith brook near where it enters the Jordan River. 
drink from the brook and eat what the ravers, ravens bring you, for I've commanded them to bring you food. So Elijah did as the Lord told him and camped beside the Kerith brook east of the Jordan. The ravens brought him bread and meat each morning and evening, and he drank from the brook. But after a while, the brook dried up, for there was no rainfall any time, anywhere in the land. Then the Lord said to Elijah, Go and live in the village of Zarephath, near the city of Sidon. I have instructed a widow there to feed you. So he went to Zarephath. As he arrived at the gates of the village, he saw a widow gathering sticks and he asked her, Would you please bring me a little water in a cup? So as she was going to get it, he called to her, Bring me a bite of bread too. But she said, I swear by the Lord your God that I don't have a single piece of bread in the house and I have only a handful of flour left in the jar and a little cooking oil in the bottom of the jug. I was just gathering a few sticks to cook this last meal and then my son and I will die. But Elijah said to her, Don't be afraid. Go ahead and do what you have said, but make a little bread for me first. Then use what's left to prepare a meal for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, There will always be flour and olive oil left in your containers until the time when the Lord sends rain and the crops grow again. So she did, she did as Elijah said, and she and Elijah and her family continued to eat for many days. There was always enough flour and olive oil in the containers, just as the Lord promised Elijah. Now, Elijah was in this situation for about two to three years. Some uh, commentators estimate three years. And I would say that these three years that Elijah, of Elijah's life right, is what I consider a sort of a wilderness. Now, why do I say that? The Google would um, define a wilderness as an uncultivated, uninhabited, inhospitable region, which means that there's nothing much there. There's nothing much to do. There's nothing much to eat. It's not some place that a person would like to be. And during this time, it seemed like Elijah was not doing anything meaningful. Nothing was happening. Now, let's put it into greater context. Why do we say that Elijah was doing nothing? We have to understand, just now I said that after this, period, uh, after this period, Elijah was going to be used to confront the entire nation of Israel to tell them to go back to the Lord. But before these three years, Elijah had appeared suddenly in the Bible record, but it was clear that Elijah was not just any small fry. How do we know this? Well, we mentioned that there is a drought, a drought right? And a famine that resulted because of the drought. Basically, there was no rain for three years in the land. Why was there no rain? Because somebody prayed to God to stop the rains. And God listened to that somebody and the rains really stopped. And you can imagine if Malaysia stopped having rain for three years, what is it going to do to us? It's going to stop the economy completely even though it's something as basic as rain. And who is the one that prayed for the rain to stop? It was Elijah. So, right, Elijah must be a prophet of no small anointing because God listened to him for such a great act. So before he entered into this time of three years, he must have been someone already with great faith that God worked through. And after these three years, he would continue to be someone that God worked through mightily. But somehow in the middle, there is like this, this part where he doesn't seem to be doing anything for God's ministry, right? Some estimates are that he spent one year by the brook. The brook is like a small river. Who is at the brook? <laughs> Nobody. <laughs> What's happening at the brook? Is he building something? No. <laughs> He's just eating and drinking. 
And after the time at the brook, where does God send him? God sends him to this small village near this city called Sidon. Now this city is an interesting city because it is a city that is very dangerous for Elijah, being the city that was the home city of the queen at the time. And the queen was very anti-Yahweh. Her, like, her life mission right, was to make the country go against the Lord and to follow the God that she worshipped, which was the idol God. And then, right, Elijah was supposed to go to this city, to this village that is very near the city, and go what to do, do, to go what, do what at this village when he goes? He's to go to a poor widow. The widow is not even a believer because the widow said to Elijah, the Lord your God. So, right, what was Elijah going to do there? For the time he stayed with, with the widow, he's just going to be at the house eating and drinking. And maybe we think, okay, he go there, he can preach to the widow. But it's just one person, right? Elijah is not like some small prophet. If he's a great prophet, surely it's more effective to put him to use, to preach to many, many people, to really continue to change the nation. And it's not even, you, you know, some weeks ago when Uncle Chuan came up to share it. He talked about the Samaritan woman, John chapter 4, right? Yeah, the, the woman is uh, not a believer and then she's uh, very low profile, nobody very significant, not influential. But even she, after Jesus preached to her, right, go and preach to a whole village and tell the village, come and see this man who told me everything I did. But Elijah preached to this woman and we have... Some clue that this woman did become a believer. But there was no such record of the woman going to change her village, much less the city that she lived in. It certainly is not like when Philip in Acts chapter 8, I think, preached to the Ethiopian who, went, who, who was very influential in his homeland and probably would have brought, you know, influenced a lot of people to go to turn uh, towards the Lord when he went back. To Ethiopia. The woman, as far as we can tell, was a low profile fella before uh, she was mentioned, and she was never mentioned again in the Bible, except by Jesus. And Jesus' point was just that God did a miracle in the life of a Gentile woman. That's it. So, why send Elijah there? to do something that is so small? Or shall we say even nothing at all? And it's not just that nothing was happening. Elijah was always in need. He, he cannot provide for himself. It's not like he can go and get a job. It's not like he's growing crops to feed himself. Nothing. He is just waiting for God to feed him day by day, month by month, week by week, in, I guess even if he wanted to grow something, he couldn't because there's no rain, right? <laughs> Nothing is going to grow. So he's not capable. He is just in need. Now, if you've ever been in need, the kind that you need people to give you money in, in order to survive, or maybe let's not look so far. Let's think about if you just live from paycheck to paycheck. That means, right, once salary come in, that there's no leftover, there's nothing for savings one, no. So once uh, anything happens out of the routine, you can't pay for it. You're stressed out. You're thinking, what, what are you going to do? It, it can be a, a period of time that is very stressful. And sometimes you may think like, why? Uh? Why am I always like this? Now, the thing is this. When this happened to Elijah, but it such a period of time did not happen to only Elijah in the Bible. It happened to many others. I can just give you two examples. Abraham wandered in the desert. He was a nomad. He lived from place to place. What is Abraham known for? Being the father of faith. Not a father of a great city. And yes, later on, his descendants became a great people. But
But during his lifetime, how many children did he have? Two. Certainly not a lot of people. So Abraham lived a life where it's like he built nothing. And that was God's purpose for him. That is where God sent him. And God make it such that David, before he was king, spent a number of years being a very simple shepherd boy. Certainly, he was not born the son of a king. He was not uh, raised in a palace like Moses was. From a shepherd boy, he was elevated to being a king. But that time was a very important time where, for him, where God put him there and he was just going to do something, do very, very simple things. Now, if God brings the people of God in the Bible into such periods of time, it goes to reason that that is God's character. That's part of how God works. And therefore, with the rest of us, highly possible that there will be periods of our time where God will bring us into also a sort of a wilderness where nothing much seems to be happening. Now, what do we mean by that? What does that look like in our lives today? Perhaps there are some of us that we are just stuck at home. When the children come, some of us have to become housewives, house husbands, who become the main caregiver of the home. And I especially want to uh, speak to young mothers and also young fathers because we have many young people that are very educated. That before they have children, right, their career is going somewhere. They're on a very good trajectory. But when the children come, right, they make a decision. They say, I, I, I need to stay home for my children. And at first, it seems okay. But as time passes by, right, you, re- you start to think, you know, hey, I've gone through so much education. I know how to do so many things. Why am I at home taking care of one child, two child, three child, at most four children? Washing clothes, mopping the floor, cooking, and just just taking care of the house. Surely God has prepared me for something greater. What am I doing here? That's something that I also wondered. (laughs) Because when, when I went to a good school and I really thought that God is going to use me for something great, great in my eyes. Like I'm going to speak to a lot of people. I'm going to be really, really like a high level person in the society. And it took me a long time to adjust, to understand that God places me where He wants to place me. There are some of us who find it difficult to adjust to such a season when we cannot seem like our wings are clipped. Never feel like that. Like you can do things, but for some reason, God is not opening the door for us to do those things. Perhaps some of us have become sick. And that's why we're in this season. So we are not able to do the things that we once were able to do. Perhaps our family member is sick and we just feel that we need to take care of them. Like, that's why like, when my mom was sick and when I stayed home, you know, I cannot come to church. Like, uh, how do I have the heart to spend all my time in the church and do all the church projects when my mom is at home and nobody take care? You will sure want to be home. But at the same time, you also feel stuck. And it's like, it's wilderness, you know. It's God bringing you into it, you know. Because it's not like, it's not like you make them sick, right? <laughs> it's not like you make yourself sick, right? It's not like you can cure yourself, right? It's not like you can cure your family member that is sick. But it's just how it is. Or perhaps we have moved to a new place, new city, new church. There's no opportunity to serve. We are starting from zero. Perhaps some of us, we are still stuck in school and we want to go to work. We think school is a waste of time. But it's like, uh, no choice but to finish. I already paid for the degree. I already paid for the diploma. Perhaps for some of us who are doing business, right, our business seems to be stagnant. We are working hard, 
but our business just seems to be small. And we can't seem to build it up. It seems like we just make enough to cover our overheads, cover our lifestyle. Perhaps we have changed to a new job. The new job doesn't seem so good. We all change to a new job because we expect better prospects, right? And perhaps we have lost our job not because we are lazy, not because we have done something wrong at work, but, you know, retrenchment. Times are bad. Perhaps we go through some kind of financial problem and perhaps as we lose our job, we're just looking for a job and we just cannot find it even though we're sending out resumes, even though we are willing to take up any kind of job. We just cannot find, like, what's the point of it? God, why did you bring me into this kind of time? Like, I'm not going anywhere in my life. When I first became a teacher, I really thought I would do very well. Because I thought, I mean, just, just work hard and I have some experience with the young people. And I thought that I was smarter than you know, most teachers, most of my peers that went to teacher training college with me. So I thought I, I, I'm going to do very well. And uh, uh, a few years ago, when I mentioned this story, some of you may remember, uh, my colleagues had to gossip about me because during my first week, I asked my supervisor, I said, what would it take for me to get promoted? In my first week of school, no? And, and actually, right, the, in my mind, I imagine that I would be head of a department in five years' time. That's very fast for a teacher in, in Singapore. If you get promoted within like three years to that level, right, you probably are like some kind of a scholar that the government has handpicked. But I was not a scholar. I, I thought that it was within possibility that I'll be able to be a principal of a school within 10 years. So if I, if I start teaching at 24, principal at 34, 35, that is very impressive. Principal at 40, also very impressive if you're not a scholar in Singapore. And I thought that I could do it. I was on track. But... I could not. In fact, things turned from bad to worse. When I was in class, I could not even do the most basic thing of controlling my students. My students control me and they control the lessons. You, you cannot, if you cannot do the basic, you cannot hope to be promoted. I could not finish my marking in time. My bosses didn't think much of me. I didn't think much of me. My colleagues didn't think much of me. And the straw that broke the camel's back is when I lost the exam papers that I marked. And you can't do that as a teacher because it shows that you really, really cannot carry out your job, you know. By the grace of God, they didn't fire me. Uh. They didn't send me any warning letter whatsoever. And after that, I, for the next two years, right, three years, I was going nowhere probably seen as a lower than, uh, less than average young, young officer in the civil service. And at one point, I just felt maybe I should quit. Because maybe I'm not making a difference where I am. I, I told them last night that uh, when I first started out, I was like, I'm going to be salt and light in my workplace. I'm going to do very well. I'm going to put a Bible on my table, leave it there so people know I'm a Christian. You know, I don't even have to preach. People will look and say, well, this guy do so well and he's like so charismatic and all that. There must be something very different about him. Wow, he's a, he's a Christian. Wow, I should come and know who this Jesus is. That was what I thought. And then as I began to do poorly at work, right, I took the Bible away. <laughs> Not that anybody noticed because I felt like I really throw God's face, you know. People see, wow, oh, this guy like that, he's a Christian, I don't want to be a Christian. <laughs> and because I, I, I tied my identity as a Christian, as a person, with my achievement. God, achievement means I'm a good Christian, means I'm a good son, a good child of God. And, and at that time, right, and... I had already had some sensing that 
one day I will come out and serve in the church full time. And so I, I, I said to God, maybe I should quit now and just go full time. Ah. You know, maybe God didn't prepare me f- to succeed in this workplace, but God prepared me to succeed in the church. And, and so I was thinking, yeah, maybe I should quit uh, three years in. Maybe at most serve my bond, and my bond was four years. Because I just, you know, what was, what was the point? But God has a purpose. Amen. God is in control. God has a plan. Let's see why God brought Elijah into this situation. When Elijah was in these three years, right, he experienced three great miracles. The first was the miracles of the birds, the ravens bring food to him at the, at the river, the brook, for one year. After that, when he went to the widow, now, we must emphasize again that the widow was very poor. Poor until he got no food to eat. If God, logically, right, if God wants to send you to a place where he'll provide for you, right, wouldn't it make more sense for God to send him to some kind of a, merchant, some kind of businessman that was very rich, that can provide for him, but God purposely sent him far away, maybe a hundred miles away, to a woman that had no food for herself. But through that impossibility, God wanted to show that he really can do anything. And so, the miracle they see for the whole two years, over and over again, how there's just the oil and the flour and they can keep eating and eating. We didn't read about this, but during those two years, the widow's son also died. Elijah was so sad about it. He prayed and said, God, bring the boy back to life. The widow's life already is so difficult. God listened to Elijah and brought the son back to life. The first recorded instance of someone coming back from death in the Bible at that time. So, God showed Elijah that his grace was always enough. Outwardly, it can seem like nothing is happening. But actually, inside, I think there was a lot happening in Elijah. It strengthened certain foundations. Because after these three years, Elijah's ministry will get very, very stressful. It would risk even his life. You have to be strong enough to withstand that kind of stress. You have, your faith in God has to be strong enough. So I think that these three years were really important for Elijah. Certain things were being dealt with, even though outwardly there were no achievements. Same for us. Why are we in the wilderness sometimes? Because God is working. God is always working. Outwardly, it seems like nothing is happening, like God is not working, but God says that He is always working. Sometimes God works the things is obvious to the eye. A lot of times when God works at the thing, it's not obvious, it's inside. It's behind the scenes. And we have to let God work. Now, my, my wife, uh, last year, she shared about how she quit her job and she went freelance. And one of the things she did was to join her father's company part-time. Her father is like retired. And so nobody is really managing the company. There is a manager, but she felt that God wanted her to go in and just be involved in the company and see how later on. And she went in, you know, with great anticipation. Now God is going to bless me after I've obeyed Him. God is going to grow the business. Through me, the business is going to grow. Never mind, maybe never grow a lot, but at least grow some as a mark of God's favour and anointing. But she went in one month, two months, three months, four months, six months. It's like, Nothing much seemed to be happening. Yes, she had certain deals that came through her, but it was not according to her expectation. We were still in need every month. And so she, be- she became like, at the back of her mind, she became stressed about it. Like, 
am I not doing something? Like, is it because I don't have enough faith? Like, what, what's wrong? And at one point, somebody invited her to a networking event. There are many of such events in, in the marketplace. There's nothing wrong with such events. But when she told me she wanted to attend the event, I said, hey, don't go lah, irritating man, when you go out, you must take care of the kid, no, don't lah. <laughs> then it's like, and, but more than that, I said, I don't think you should go because I think God wants to teach you that He is your provider. But she's like, no lah, I really, I really want to go, I really want to try it out. But because, you know, she's bringing more money than me, so I just keep quiet lah, must respect my wife. And just try to support her. Lah. It's, it's only like a one-off, right? And so I tried to uh, and, and so that night she decided she's gonna go. She told uh, Christina, okay, uh, mommy's gonna go to this thing, uh, okay. When you wake up, you're not gonna be able to see mommy, okay? You just papa will bring you to school and whatever it is. Alright. But some weird things happened the night that before she was going to go. First of all, she had a dream. In the dream, she uh, she lost me and Christina again. Um, but she managed to find me, yet she couldn't find Christina. Then she woke up. Because, right, Christina had woken up in the middle of the night, somehow, you know, which she doesn't really do. And, and we thought she wanted to go to the toilet or what, but no. Uh, Christina just woke up and said, Mommy, where are you going? I said, no, I'm not going anywhere. Are you going off soon? Yes. Mommy, don't go. I love you, Mommy. Stay here. Don't go. I want you. Then, Chris, then my wife is like, oh, okay, maybe she you know she's talking in her dream or what. So okay, Mommy won't go. Then she's waiting for Christina to fall back asleep, which she normally would do. So she wait and wait and wait and wait, 15, 20 minutes. Eh, then she, she time to go, no? So she tried to want to go already. But Christina was still holding on to her and we can't say, Mommy, don't go. I love you, Mommy. Don't go. I want you to be with me. Then she's like, this is very weird. My daughter doesn't usually do that. And it coupled with the dream, then she felt that, yes, maybe God doesn't want me to go. So she didn't go. The next day when she told me all these things happened, then she, I said, why do you think this is happening? She said, I think because God wants my faith to be pure. Well, once I hear this, uh, I know, most likely this is not from my wife, but this is from God. Because the concept of a pure faith, right, is actually a very high-level Christian concept. The idea that we trust in God alone, that God wants us to see that no other things can save us. Many of us, we think we believe in it, but our action shows that our faith is Half, half one. It's a matter of proportion. Is it more towards God or more towards other things? But the idea that God wants our faith to be pure, there's no other hint that, another, that my wife's providence will come from something else. God wanted that. God always wants us to know Him more in any situation but especially in situations like this, when nothing much is happening. So, for my situation, when I had the idea to quit, actually, soon after that, I said, no, I'm not going to quit. The reason is this, because when I had that thought, deep down, I knew that I was quitting not to serve God, but because I I wanted to run away from having the no achievement. It was very uncomfortable for me. It felt very unnatural for me. I wanted to run away. And that is the wrong reason. So I didn't want to go because God had called me, but because I was running. And so I said, no, I will put my head down and I'll continue working uh, until God calls me to leave. That happened uh, a few years ago, but by that time, I had lasted eight, nine years, uh, way longer than I thought I would last in the school. We must realize that Elijah 
did not try to leave or change the situation on his own as well. When did Elijah go to the widow when God told him to? When did God tell him? After the river dried up, not before. So imagine when the river dried up already, right? The panic sets in for us. But Elijah just stay, you know, obediently stay. He trusted that God would continue to provide for him even if there's no more river. This whole period of time in the wilderness, no accomplishment, no achievement, no anything, lasted three years. But every day, he is learning about God. He's not through some kind of class or some preaching or whatever, but through his life, he really saw for himself that God is enough for him. So, brothers and sisters, I encourage you, if you're in the wilderness, do not try to leave until God brings you out. If not, we really, really miss out. We miss out on the work that God is doing. We will lose out. Amen.